Thanks, George. Thank you. I want to thank the faculty of uh, Sam Houston State University College of Criminal Justice for inviting me here. Uh, there are more seats down here. For those of you that are, uh, please feel free. There are seats over here as, here as well. Um, please be comfortable. It is always a, a compliment to be introduced by somebody that you taught at one time. Um, inevitably, when you pass a particular threshold, that introduction includes some reference to age. And um, I will just add to it a little bit. It, one of the things that happens as you teach uh, is that every year the students look younger and younger and younger. Uh, everyone understands that. Then later on when you have parents' days and things like that, all of a sudden the parents of the students are looking younger and younger and younger. And then you start thinking about spending more time with your grandchildren, which is something that I spend considerable time thinking about. I want to talk to you today about the business of policing and changes that are taking place in the business of policing. I'm using the word business uh, quite advisedly here because the model that I'm going to use to talk about policing essentially is a private corporate model that uh, I have adapted for uses to think about policing. Um, the, article, uh, it, uh, the article that first used this model was published in the Harvard NIJ uh, Perspective Series and is referred to as the Evolving Strategies of Policing. I, I wrote that article during the summer of 1985. Um, I, uh, I wrote it in many respects like an anthropologist would, uh, would write, and, and that is struck by what was happening in the field. I not only was, was interested in what was happening now, but I was interested in what happened in the past that got us to our present situation. And what in, in, in the past is driving the present set of changes that are going on in policing. And those uh, ruminations led me not only then to think about the past and the present, but the future as well. So the model uses is a particular analytic device for looking at the history of policing, for looking at policing at the present time, and for looking at the changes that are going on in policing. Um, and um, uh, I will uh, update the, uh, the article somewhat and go on to what I think now is really happening within policing and uh, I think try to further define uh, that which is called community policing or problem-oriented policing uh, for, uh, uh, for those of you that uh, are interested in the business of policing or even in the model of, uh, of analysis. Sub so subsequently I've done increasing amounts of historical research to make sure that I was right in terms of these speculations. Fortunately, I think, I was, I, I, I think my, my historical research has, has uh, proved that um, um, I was correct in some of my uh, analyses, but that will only be told over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, but let me then begin by, by presenting basically what the model is. And that is it's possible to look at any organization using various elements and identify a strategy. The first element in the public sector is authority. In the private sector, you would refer to this as capital. The second category is the function or business. The third category is the structure and management processes. You'll forgive my handwriting. Uh, this is structure and management processes. The third, the next category is demand. The next is the relationship to the environment. The next is tactics methods, activities, all of those mean the same thing. And the final is outcome. Regardless of the organization, whether it's a business, 
whether it's a, um, uh, whether it's a, a school system, it's possible to uh, analyze that organization or institution uh, using these categories. And what I want to do is to um, analyze policing using these categories and begin with the, with the category of authority. We are used to thinking of the police as being authorized by the law, especially the criminal law. That wasn't the case as much in early American policing. Those of you that remember the history of policing remember that the policing model that developed early was based on the English system, which was devised by Sir Robert Peel and others during the early 19th century. There, the source of authority basically was the crown and the law, and that model, when translated, that bureaucratic model of policing, when translated into America, unfortunately didn't have the same basis of authority, fortunately or unfortunately. The circumstances in the United States were much different at that time than in England. In England, political and social elites were very concerned about the issues of how to police England. There were debates, there were debates about how to police England for over 100 years, with many people pushing for a standing police force, other people resisting it, especially because of how the police had evolved in France. And it was only after decades and decades of intense debate by political elites, Sir Robert Peel, uh, 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 the Pitts, Henry Fielding, uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, John Stuart Mills, the political and social and philosophical elites of the time debated policing. There was nothing comparable to that in the United States. Cities in the United States were having some of the same problems that London and other large cities were, and they simply decided, that looks like a good idea. And policing, bureaucratic policing, was transferred into the United States setting. But the political establishment or the political units that imported that model were not the national government or the state government, but they were cities. And policing began in the, to take the same forms as urban government at that, at, at, at that time. Now we're talking the middle uh, 19th century, 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, first police departments, 1845 or so, 1855, Milwaukee has a police department. The idea spread like wildfire in the United States. But again, policing took on the same organizational pattern of government at the time. And at that time, as, as many of you know, there was a great struggle for control of the cities. On the one hand, there were the original Dutch and English settlers who wanted to maintain control of cities and the immigrant populations the Jews, the Italians, the Irish, uh, the Poles, take, Germans take your city and you have a different mix, were taking over the cities slowly and gaining political control of the cities. And the struggles finally resolved in immigrant political machines, democratic machines generally, taking over the cities, and those machines administered cities in very decentralized ways. And that is you had ward systems with ward bosses, and those ward bosses controlled, largely controlled, uh, the political and social life of those particular wards or neighborhoods. When policing was imported into the United States, it was overlaid on this kind of political system. And police departments looked much like this. Each ward basically developed its own particular police department. Oh, you had a central chief, but the precinct captain or commander was generally appointed by the ward boss most of the police were appointed from the area. And so what you had here in this model was political authorization for policing. The basic authority for policing was political. You had law and you had criminal law, but the captain and the officers got their authority from this decentralized political establishment. And the careers of the precinct captains and the careers of the police officers in many areas were directly related to the careers of the ward bosses to the local politicians. The local politician goes out, out goes the precinct commander. Well, you can imagine that that creates an interesting situation. There would be uh, tremendous pressure, uh, to use a euphemism, to keep experienced leadership. Because if you didn't keep the ward boss in office, you didn't keep your job. Well, you can see already there might be some problems inherent in that, but basically, 
the authority was political. In, in terms of the function, the business, the business was the provision of services. And every bit of his, the more we read history, the more historians begin to analyze policing of this era, we discover that, yes, they were involved in law enforcement. But in addition, their primary role was defined as crime prevention, and that's similar to law enforcement, but not the same. But also, they provided a broad array of services. And some of them were quite trivial and, and have been trivialized, and that is um, 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 knocking at doors to wake people up, um, uh, but more importantly, they provided lodging and police stations that were built especially to have lodging places for immigrant workers coming into town. They devised the first um, um, bread lines and soup lines. They provided basic city services, and so they were a broad service agency. In terms of structure, you can see just from the very nature of the political structure, that, that basically it would be a decentralized organization. Chiefs, in comparison to precinct commanders, were relatively powerless. It was the precinct commanders, in collaboration with ward bosses, that basically ran the precincts, and so this was a strongly decentralized management and structural system. Demand in early police departments, if you wanted a cop, how did you get a cop? You open up the window and you yell for a cop, you ran to the station, you went to see your ward boss, or you went to see the precinct captain, but demand again, as the structure was, was decentralized. The relationship to the environment was, of course, intimate. It, if, you, if you're going to police in an area, uh, odds are and were recruited by the ward boss and the precinct captain, odds are you lived in the area. You knew the people. You were on an, on an intimate basis. You lived there. You worked there. You knew the people. Now, you might not know all the people. And it turns out that neighborhoods weren't all that homogenous. You know, Jews lived in Italian areas, vice versa. But nonetheless, the, the relationship to the environment was basically an intimate environment, especially with the dominant political group or ethnic group that got you your job in the first place. In terms of tactics, the basic tactics was foot patrol. Basic tactic was foot patrol. And in early police departments, detectives didn't even exist. Detecting, and that is finding out who committed the crime, if the person wasn't caught right away, was largely remained in the private sector until late in the 20th century. Late in the 19th century, excuse me. And when detectives were first brought into policing, they were brought in from the, from the outside, from private security, rather than meaning promotions. And generally, in early policing, detectives and corruption were almost synonymous. And that is, any time you had a corruption scandal, we still see much of this today, although it's changing, G generally it was, it, it was the, the, the detective units that brought corruption in. And then finally, in terms, and, and, and so foot patrol with the idea of preventing crime and providing services was the, was, the, uh, uh, was the basic tactic. And in terms of outcome, it would be political and citizen satisfaction. And that is, if you're a police officer, a precinct commander, the first thing you were concerned were to keep the politicians satisfied. And if you wanted to keep the politicians satisfied, you kept the citizens satisfied. And so, as a result, the measures of performance were largely linked to the next election, were largely linked to the, key, to, to the maintenance of power, and so political and citizen satisfaction generally uh, were the measures of, uh, measures of performance. Now, you wrap this all together, and I call this a strategy. This is a strategy of policing in which the authority is political, the function is broad services, the structure is decentralized, the demand is decentralized, the relationship with the environment is intimate, the tactics are foot patrol, and the outcomes are citizen satisfaction. Now, one can argue, if one reads history carefully, one can argue that this, that this model, this paradigm, this strategy, use your word, 
uh, had its successes. Order was maintained, services were provided, order would break down at times. Uh, uh, nonetheless, most problems tended to be solved informally. There were arrests, but arrests were more of a problem then than they are now. When, before, be, before call, call boxes or even after call boxes, once you arrested somebody, what did you do with them? Well, you could handcuff them around a tree or around the call box, but, but arrests were troublesome. Um, um, and uh, one can read accounts, read Tom Rapetto's The Blue Parade, for example, uh, of times when approval of, of the style of policing was very high. But there are also serious problems with this model. And those serious problems tended mostly to be, link, to be linked to the source of the authority. Because basically, basically three problems of corruption, not to mention inefficiencies, developed with this model. The first problem had to do with financial corruption. And while not akin to the corruption that occurred after prohibition, which was systematic and uh, pervasive in police departments across the United States, there was a lot of mom-and-pop uh, mom style corruption. And, and that is um, enforcing many of the laws that were foisted on cities by the Dutch and the English who didn't like, uh, my, my name is really Kuehling, K-U-E-L-L-I-N-G, German, who didn't like my grandfather's uh, beer gardens to be open on Sunday. Uh, I can still recall them slightly, where the food was free and the beer was a nickel and uh, the entire family went. Uh, the Dutch and the English didn't think that was such a great idea and passed laws, Sunday blue laws, other kinds of vice laws that were, that were very unpopular in the immigrant communities. We were trying to set up a particular lifestyle that was consistent with how they lived their lives in the past. Well, it didn't take much to discourage police officers from not, from not enforcing those laws. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't a, 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 a steep you didn't need a steep slope for them to start to get some money for doing that. So there were problems of some financial corruption. There were also the problems associated with being in the political pockets of, of ward bosses, which led to one of their functions being, as I have facetiously referred to before, keeping political operatives in office. And there were a wide variety of ways that the police could, uh, could do that, stuffing ballot boxes, um, um, having dead people vote, um, keeping some people from voting. We still see some of these things today. Uh, we view them as relatively uncivilized where they occur, but um, um, uh, 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 the uh, 19th century American cities were a good model for many emerging countries at the present time about ways not to handle elections. But anyways, the police became seriously involved in political corruption, and that is keeping particular people in office. And then finally, there was the issue of equitable policing. And that is, it's nice to think of neighborhoods as warm and pleasant, to use the German word, filled with Gemittelkeit, et cetera, but also they can be parochial, perverse, and mean, and petty. And the function of the police can also be to keep people out and to keep people, different kinds of people, out of particular areas of the community. I can remember when I was a boy uh, in Milwaukee, the viaducts that divided the north side and the south side of Milwaukee. The African-American community at that time lived in the near north side. African-Americans went across the viaduct in one direction. They went north. They didn't go south. And if they were on the viaduct going south, they were impolitely told to get back to their side of town. That was part of the policing business. Union leaders like Robert Bob Kleisman, who I do work with to this day, who's president of the International Union of AFL-CIO, thought that that was part of the job. He thought it was the right thing to do at the time. But those kinds of traditions carried on to this time. He thinks it's a tragedy now, and we live with the consequences. But nonetheless, that kind of policing also led to the problem of serious abuse and discrimination uh, in the name of neighborhood integrity, uh, ethnic unity, etc., and, of course, we, we're seeing a lot of the consequences of that now. During the late 19th century, external reformers, referred to as muckrakers, journalists, uh, ministers, outsiders, uh, political reformers, uh, um, um, often Republican, allied with the 
with the state uh, legislatures, moved to try and change policing again and again and again, but policing remained largely impervious to those attempts to change. It wasn't until the 20th century that two police leaders began to articulate a different view of policing. One we don't know much about, his name is Arthur Woods, who was a commissioner in New York City, and laid out a view of policing that was very complicated, saw policing as very complex. Not many people read him anymore. The other day I went to get his books out of the Harvard Library, which, by the way, is a great library. It, it, it really is something. They're in storage. Uh, it would take me a week to be able to get them. Um, um, it, 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 it was a kind of sad. But the other name we know very well and we read more and more. The other name was August Vollmer. Now, Vollmer was a very interesting and, and complex guy, and I wish I could spend more time about him. He was generally seen as the father of the model of policing that dominated until, the, uh, until at least the late 1970s. I think that's a mistake. I, I don't think he was. I don't think that that does him justice. It doesn't do justice to what he did as a police leader in Berkeley, California, because what he did, what he did at that time was remarkable. But I, I can't go into that now. Uh, um, 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 Vollmer starts out going in one direction, and unfortunately, his students led him in another direction, and, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But their primary, the primary concern of the reformers was how do we get control of police, whether it's line police or whether it's priests and commanders, how do we get control of police? And that is to usurp the control from the politicians and to get control over the activities of police. Every reform element, and I have quotes from the reformers where they're very explicit, every element of the change that they wanted to implement in policing had as its primary focus the control of police. Their preoccupation was the control of police. Now, in ways that I think ultimately and historically that, became a, that, that preoccupation with control became a problem, but at that time it was completely understandable. And the primary authors were, first of all, V.A. Leonard, and that's conventional spelling. And the other name I think you all know very well was O.W. Wilson, who wrote the classic police text that people still read to this day, and with considerable value. Now, these, now despite the fact that I think the consequences of what they did were tragic, they were good people, thoughtful people, moral people, trying to come to grips with this particular problem, the political control of police departments. But to get to the bottom line, their preoccupation with control ultimately led to some of the serious problems that we have with police at the present time. So, uh, so hear me right, because I'm, in, in many respects, I'm not very kind in my writings to, their, to the work that they did. I think that they were wrong. They might have been right for a time, but the model, especially the administrative model that they set up, which, which was preoccupied with control of the line officers, ultimately created serious problems of policing, and I think have led to it to be a grumpy occupation at the present time. And if there's one thing that characterizes American policing at the present time, especially line police, they tend to be extraordinarily grumpy. They don't go into policing grumps, but by the time they're just about out of the academy, they become pretty grumpy. And after maybe being on the street five or six years, they start to change and become less grumpy. But policing tends to be a grumpy, bitching lot. That's too bad. Uh, but I, and I think there are ways to deal with that. So, but the shift here, the first shift that they successfully made was that they moved from political control to law and ultimately with the courts to constitutional authority. They needed the courts, and we can go back to 60s decisions with this, they needed the courts primarily to get control of the detectives. And that was with the exclusionary rule, because we can go back as, as, as recently as the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and police in the United States were still using torture. Torture somewhat akin to the torture that is being alleged used to this youth in Singapore to get the confession. Um, uh, cold rooms, bright lights, uh, third degree, those kinds of issues. But finally, with the support of the court, which created uh, 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 with Miranda, with some other decisions, but that the primary source of authority was going to be the criminal law. 
Why do police what they do what they do? Because it's the law. That's the justification. And on top of that, they were going to add professionalism. But professionalism meant something very, very distinct for the reformers. And it is not professionalism as we think of the professoriate or as we think of the of physicians or lawyers. It's a very unique bureaucratic kind of professionalism that really is not the classic term of professionalism. The second, the second element, the function, they were to be law enforcers. Crime fighters. The thin blue line. You know the language and the rhetoric. Understand that law enforcement is different than crime prevention. It's part of crime prevention, but it's a very narrow view of the function of police. First of all, they wanted to wipe out all, this, all the services. In New York City, they wiped out traffic, they wiped out ambulance, they wiped out, uh, you know, thing, function after function. The idea was to narrow the function to law enforcement and, to, and in the name of having the police be less intrusive in the community, have the police be a reactive force rather than in a proactive force in the community. Because law enforcement and later 911 you will recognize as basically reactive tactics. And that what you have in, in the value of the police not being too intrusive in a society, and we value that in the United States, we worry a lot about police being too intrusive. In the value of their not being too intrusive, police would essentially wait for something to happen. They'd, wa they'd ride in their cars, and if there was a report of a crime, or any other kind of call for service, they'd respond to that and investigate reactively. Police departments in the United States shifted, and this is the key, they shifted from policing, which is broad, to law enforcement, which is narrow. And law enforcement, as you know, the model of crime control in that is a model that you study in criminal justice. And that is you arrest and process for the purpose of incapacitation, uh, primary and secondary deterrence, and depending upon your belief systems, re, uh, rehabilitation. But notice that that is a very narrow sense of crime prevention, because there are all kinds of other activities police can and maybe should do that are preventive in nature, but that in this model they largely stopped doing. And thus, for example, you notice you'll get to a large police department in, in, in the United States and depending upon the size of the department, you'll find 2, 10, 15 officers involved in a special unit that's called crime prevention. That's an interesting tip-off about what the business of that police department is. The primary business is law enforcement. And, of course, this model ultimately got reified or glorified or built up in the President's Commission in, 19, uh, in the mid-1960s that Vic knows so much about and... Uh, um, um, we were involved in watching it develop at the time. And that was, it was a new view of the police. Up until then, the police had been viewed as an arm of local government. In the President's Commission report, police became the front end of a criminal justice system. And, as the front end, and what does the front end of the criminal justice system do? It processes people through and not only that, at the same time, we were dealing with labeling theory, and, and, and we believe that, that uh, um, uh, 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 we had a whole set of beliefs that said, well, we don't want the police intervening too much because if they start arresting youth, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We don't want the police involved in PAL. We don't want the police too intrusive in the community. We want to back off, and we want to give people more, uh, 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 more freedom. So the business became law enforcement. Here... The business, here the business, excuse me, the structure and the management processes became strongly centralized. And the model that policing adapted was a modification of the military model and was less the military model than the factory model that was de developed by Frederick Taylor at the time. The same model that, 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 that was developed for manufacturing Fords and bobby pins and whatever was adapted to police. And the ideas implicit in the factory model were the ideas that came to dominate police management. And the idea was there that line people needed close supervision. They did routine work. Their functioning was very narrow. They didn't use discretion. And that they were over, their work was overseen by, uh, by sergeants 
expertise was in middle management. These people did and didn't think. These people did the thinking. These people did the enforcing. And these people got the authority. But, but, this, but this was a non-discretionary, routinized, specialized task. And as Egon Bittner pointed out and other people have pointed out, city police got the work that was left over. Corporate crime, economic crimes went to the FBI. Later on, we got the DEA. Um, um, if there was any kind of a particular problem, you'd create a particular unit to deal with that problem. The line officers, they dealt with what was left over, the residual crimes. And, and what kind of people did you need for this job? You needed persons, and I use this now with quotes around, with manly virtues. They were big, honest. It didn't matter how smart they was because anyone could recognize when somebody broke the law, and they had to be able to fill out simple reports. That, that was, that was, it, it was viewed as a non-complex, non-discretionary kind of job. It was routine. And you could shift people from shift to shift, from beat to beat, you could shift them around. Why? Because just like a factory worker, what they did was so routine that they were replaceable. And it didn't matter whether they worked the same beat or worked the same shift, you can move them around freely. In terms of relationship to the environment, that was switched to remote. The best metaphor, the best analogy is, uh, some of you that seen the old, uh, some of you in this room remember seeing it the first time around, but uh, some of you have seen the reruns of Sergeant Friday, um, uh, Jack Webb. And that is, uh, a woman has been assaulted and beaten up, and she calls the police, and Sergeant Friday and his cohort knock on the door. The woman op op opens the door, and she's upset, she's hysterical, she's been badly beaten up by someone that she knows, and Sergeant Friday's response is typical of the model. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Why? What's the business of the police? The business of the police is to solve the crime. Somebody else can tend, tend to the woman as a human being. Somebody else can deal with the guilt and the rage and the, the other problems. The police job is very narrow. It's to solve the crime. It, the remote professionalism that you now see in police officers, that's so troublesome, is really very much inculcated in a model of staying remote from the community. Why? We don't want the community to influence people. Why? If the community influences them, they're going to be badly influenced and are going to become corrupt. This is the issue around control that deliberately removed police officers from close working relationships within the community. We never thought through, or it was never thought through, what the consequences of that would be. The amount of fear that any citizen develops in any neighborhood if that person doesn't know the people. And the extreme fear that a white officer would develop working in a black community. And so what we had is not only officers what developed, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, was not only officers that were, quote, quote, professionally remote, but officers that were scared to death. And you ride with officers, and I don't you take the city, the last, the last example I have of this, I'm riding with an officer in the evening in Indianapolis, white officer. Been on the force for two years. We go, we go by a public housing development that's 95, 96, 100 percent African American. The officer rides ride by that neighborhood and says to me, every, every person that lives in that development hates us. Hates us. And he believes that. He has no contact with those citizens. I met the night before with citizens from that development. I met with them in a church outside of the development because they were afraid to have me come in because I looked too much like an old cop, at least, and, and, and the drug dealers that were operating in that area would probably, they were fearful that, they, that the drug dealers would retaliate against them. And, 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 those, and those citizens were saying, please, get the cops in here. Please get them in here and have them stay. Meantime, we have police riding around there saying, everyone in there hates us. That was one of the consequences of the remote relationship. And tactics became basically reactive tactics. That is, you, riding around in a car becomes an end in itself. And think of the phrase, and I know you've probably seen this already, in service and out of service. When is a police car in service? A police car is in service when the officer is riding in the car doing nothing else. A police car is out of service when the police car is stopped, and the officer's dealing with citizens. And what's the organizational pressure? Get back in service. 
So the premium, the work, is riding in cars. That, the organizational pressure, is to get back in the car and ride. And whether one looks at special units, detectives, or 911, basically all the tactics, all the tactics are reactive. Finally, the outcome here, arrests, rapid response, and crime rates. Now, because I'm rushing through this, I mentioned some of the downsides of some of these, of, of some of this strategy. And again, we have a strategy here. What's the authority? Is law, constitution, professionalism. Function is law enforcement. The structure is strongly centralized. Little discretion here. Relationship to the environment is remote, etc. Now, a couple problems. First of all, I mentioned one. The remoteness is a problem in itself. We started to learn that during the 1960s, and during the 1960s, the complaint primarily came from the African-American community. And the response was community relations. We believed that rapid response and preventive patrol were so important that what we'd have to do is to continue to do that, but we'd have to develop community relations, especially in minority communities, to convince people that we had to keep doing that which the citizens didn't like us doing in the first place. That was, that was the origin of community relations. The other problem was, this didn't describe the work of police. What we started to learn with the report of the American Bar Association during the 1950s was that police work was infinitely complex. And that despite the fact that the rhetoric was there's no discretion, that discretion was of the essence of the work. Now, that's a complicated story. That's all I can say about it. We also discovered that the managerial model didn't work. And that is, police don't work under supervision. They make most of their critical decisions when they're alone. And those critical decisions are of enormous consequence. The only group that we give, the only license to kill that we give is to police officers. And under certain circumstances, it's almost a mandate to kill. And they do it when they're alone or with a partner. The idea of oversight and, and what we discover is all of these rules and regulations, you start going through rules and regulations in the police department, and it's an eye-opener. The rules and regulations virtually have nothing to do with the work of police. What they do is to deal with the internal relationships between ranks, how to fill out forms. They deal with the bureaucratic issues. They have no guidance at all when you run into a particularly complex situation. And we find out that officers can get in trouble doing things by the book, and they can get into trouble by deviating. It doesn't matter. They can get into trouble. And part of the reason why police officers are so grumpy is that police officers begin to understand what the purpose of many of the rules and regulations are. And that is, if they do something publicly embarrassing, they can always be gotten on the violation of some rule. The classic example of that was in the Je Jeffrey Dahmer case in Milwaukee, which I won't go into detail except to make one point. But that's a very interesting case with those officers being fired. One of the grounds for firing the officers was that they didn't enforce the curfew law. Nobody in Milwaukee at that time enforced the curfew law. You'd have to fire every cop for not enforcing the curfew law. What did that say to the police officers? What's the purpose of this rules and regulations? If we screw up, even a good faith screw up, what's going to happen is that these rules and regulations that don't have much to do with our actual work are going to be used to get us. The rules and regulations make us sacrificial lambs. The other part of this that I'll go through very quickly, as I am running out of time, is that, is that the interesting thing is because the work was defined as law enforcement and all the data that was collected was about law enforcement, police wound up in a very interesting bind. And that was, it turned out that only less than 20% of their work had anything to do with law enforcement. That meant all the rest of the things that they were doing, no, nobody counted anything. It was non-work. It was miscellaneous. Now, on the one hand, that's bad enough because that creates a situation in which the bulk of the work goes unrewarded. That something's wrong in any administration, in any administrative system when that's the case. But it becomes more perverse when it turns out that the only outcome, if you don't collect any of the good stuff that have to do with the good share of your work, the only outcome, some of that can be if somebody complains. And so for most of the work that you do, 
the, the only possible outcome, because nobody knows about it and there are no records of it, the only outcome can be a complaint against your work. Don't be surprised when police officers are grumpy then. That's a perverse system because it doesn't recognize what the vast majority of the work is. The tactic, and, 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 and we talked about the tactics here. Now, what's happening to policing now? I don't use the term community policing much anymore. I don't use the term problem-oriented policing much anymore. I use the term policing. Because what we're now understanding is that, and, and this gets a little scary, but the world has changed a lot since here. What we're really saying is the view of police as law enforcement was an invention, a 1920s and 30s invention, that was implemented during the 40s, 50s, and 60s that failed. It failed to describe the work, it failed to deal with crime, it failed in a whole series of dimensions. We are now returning to the business of policing and the primary issue on the table now, and this is something with, uh, with, that I'll be talking to the graduate students about tomorrow, is a slightly different model. We have redefined the function. We've said, hey, it's not law enforcement, it's policing. And that's nothing new. Police have always done policing. We just don't count it or we just don't manage it. Secondly, we're redefining the tactics. And many of you read the work of Herman Goldstein. He's, been, he's done the best job of redefining the tactics of, of, of anyone. The issue now, the critical issue, is this right here. How do we organize to support this, this function? How do we organize police departments? And police departments, police are scared to death of that. When I first laid out this model and had the time to list here and say, well, what are we looking at authority? Well, we're talking from citizens. And what are we talking about function? Well, we're talking about a broader function. We start going down this, and it looks remarkably like this. Police chiefs and police executives panicked. Why did they panic? Because in the back of their minds was, uh, um, uh, 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 was, was the rhetoric that they've learned for 50 years and read about for 50 years. How do you control your deviant officers? And you talk to New York City precinct captains about turning their officers loose to do police work. And, they, and what flashes through their mind, my God, I got those nine drunks, I got those two guys that are corrupt, that I think are corrupt, I got, and you're telling me to turn them loose? Well, see, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong issue. They are loose. The drunks are out there. The deviant officers are out there. This model isn't addressing the problems of corruption. It isn't controlling the officers. Then think of a model here a management model that's going to deal with the, those problems. That's the issue that Bratton is dealing with now in uh, New York. Uh, you, you pick the city, and they're wrestling with it to various degrees of success. But most are afraid to bite the organizational model issue because so much is at stake. So much is at stake at that. Well, you've got, you've got 45 seconds less left for 19 questions. I'm sorry. I took you through a lot of material. I went very fast. Any questions? One of the things that was left out of my uh, introduction was the fact that in my first incarnation, I was a seminarian. I did two things while well, I learned two things. One, how to twist the text to meet the message. I might be guilty of some of that this, in this. The second was to learn how to preach, and you heard me preach here because I think this is the evolution of policing. Thank you for your attention.